Welcome into the Football Guys DFS show. We are here for week two. We had uh, some good successes across the board in week one. And then also some people here mentioned Taysom Hill's name. And that didn't go very well. But we, uh, we're we going to load it up. We got better games this week. We have going to hit your cash plays for DraftKings and FanDuel. And then we'll move through GT GPPs. We'll hit our favorite stacks. We'll hit our discount plays. But first off, we did do a little bit of a giveaway last week off of Taysom Hill. And uh, Devin, do you have the winner of that? Yeah, it's uh, M Prescott M is the winner. Um, so contact me uh, in your email or in YouTube or send it to knots at footballguys.com or really however you want to do it. Um, and whoever's computer's binging, that's going to drive me insane. Um, but... <laughs> uh yeah so m prescott m congratulations i think he had 3.5 points and you guessed five something like that we're doing another giveaway though uh, um so we're going to continue to do giveaways as long as you guys have interest in them this week we're giving away a jersey of jersey of your choice so it could be a player a team whatever it is any size um and caveat here we have to have 150 likes Last week, I think we had 100. You guys have done this before. Just go give it like, give the like, give the subscribe, whatever you guys do on YouTube. Um, but you got to have 150. So it's a bigger, it's a bigger prize this week. To win, you have to comment how many points Jonathan Taylor will have on DraftKings this week. Favorable matchup going up against Green Bay. Uh, we saw what Saquon Barkley did last week. So he should be in a good spot, but how many points will Jonathan Taylor score? Winner of that gets a, a jersey um, of their choice. There we go. We're just busting into the vault, giving out jerseys. And uh, for a proper introduction, I, I am Jeff Bell. I am here, and I'm joined by our DFS captain, Devin Knotts, and then Phil Alexander, as always. And, and Phil's smarting a little bit because his Jets had a tough loss on Monday Night Football. But Phil is going to lead us off, and he's going to give us the games of the week that he's watching for this coming slate. Sure thing. Uh, before we do that, Jeff, shout out to you. I understand that you were the number one projector across the fantasy industry in week one, according to Fantasy Pros Expert Consensus. Yeah, imagine that. That, that was a little bit of a fortunate stroke for me. So I, I was thrilled to be able to do that. And thank you for that mention there. But Blind squirrel uh, finds a nut. <laughs> hey, what? Nevin knows how it is. Well, props to you. Uh, Jeff you. Bell is a sharp dude. So uh, now you know he's got the bona fides. Listen to what he says. Um, so, yeah, first thoughts on this slate is that I want to play a lot of Rams. Uh, I think that that's one of the games that we're targeting, Rams at Cardinals, 49-point uh, over-under. Uh, I might be burying the lead, though. I think the marquee game might be Bucks at Lions with a 51.5-point total. Lions projected to win by seven, according to Vegas. Uh, and then the third highest would be Bengals at Chiefs. Chiefs are a heavy favorite at home over under there, 47 and a half. Uh, and then because I could never stop at just three, uh, I'm going to give you three somewhat interesting games. Uh, these are games, again, where mostly I'm interested in sides. Uh, but I do think that Saints at Cowboys at a 43 and a half over under has shootout potential. And I love the Raven side of uh Raiders at Ravens. Ravens are, are big favorites there, almost double digits. Uh, and then the 49er side at the Vikings with a 45 and a half point total looks pretty good. Devin, Phil always gets all the games. Did he miss anything? No, he laid six out of what, the 10, 10 games? I'm good. <laughs> I think I am too, but I think it's, you're definitely right there. There's some major matchups to target. And there's also a lot of landmines. I saw there's some really low numbers across the board. Like I saw, I think Denver and Pittsburgh sitting at like a 36 point total. And that's like Iowa football range. So it's, it's interesting what we saw last week. It's low scoring across the board, but we're stepping into it. Hopefully we get a little bit more offense this coming week. But before we do that, please take a moment to like, and subscribe to this video. Like the channel, subscribe so you never miss anything. And, and like Devin said, with that Jonathan Taylor giveaway, give us those likes and you can win that jersey. But Devin, we're going to do our cash games now. And we start out with quarterbacks. 
Last week, you hit it on the nose pretty well when you started out the lineups with Jaden Daniels. What are you looking at for quarterback this week? Yeah, it's another easy week. It's Justin Fields, 5,400, um, going up against Denver. He ran the ball 14 times last week, and it's going to be a trend like I talked about last week. I want mobile quarterbacks. Ran for 57 yards. Um, so not, you know, he didn't crush it, but this is a bad, this is a bad front seven for Denver. Um, they lost Josie Jewell in the offseason. Um, and they're starting some guys that really shouldn't be starting at linebacker. So I think that's good. And they lost both their safeties as well. So Kareem Jackson and Justin Simmons both left in the offseason. So I think it, it's it's a good opportunity for Fields to run all over again this uh Denver defense. Um especially on FanDuel where he's 7K. I think he's in a really good spot. If you wanted a little more consistency or a little more predictability, I know Fields is a little volatile. You could go back to Jaden Daniels at 6,200 um, against the Giant against the Giants. This Giants defense is, I mean, we talked about it last week but uh, with Aaron Jones, but they're horrendous. They can't tackle. Uh, Micah McFadden led the NFL all players in missed tackle percentage last year, um, including corners, and he's a linebacker. So that's a huge problem. Um, and Daniel, Jaden Daniels showed that he can run the ball as well. So I, I'm not necessarily targeting, especially early on in the year. We've seen passing numbers, like they're down because I don't think people are playing as much in the preseason. I don't know if that's the effect or it's just like people are adjusting to two high safeties or whatever it is, but it's probably a combination of just everything. And for that, I'll take I'll take the mobile quarterbacks early on. Would you so we saw heavy volume go to George Pickens last week. Is it is linking George Pickens and Justin Fields too risky for a cash game lineup, or is that something you would consider doing? You don't have to. I I, I think it's um it's something you could do, but you certainly don't have to. Okay. Phil, do you have any other quarterbacks that you're targeting for your cash game plays? Nope. I think Devin hit it on the head. Uh, although I'd put him in a different order for me, it's Jaden Daniels one and Justin Fields two. Uh, I wish I had listened to Devin last week instead of uh, getting a little bit misguided on my week one projections uh, and shouting out Caleb Williams as a, a, a cash game play last week. Luckily I, I didn't play. Caleb Williams by the time Sunday rolled around. Uh, in fact, I played Justin Fields, though. And my hesitance to play him this week, it, it wasn't just that he didn't have a great game for fantasy despite the 14 rushes for 57 yards. It's that I'm afraid that the Steelers coaching staff is so conservative that they're not going to let him be Justin Fields. They're not going to let him freewheel. They're not going to let him play uh, you know, backyard football, the way that the Colts are doing with Anthony Richardson. Um, so 5.8 air yards per attempt on his passes last week were 26th out of 32 quarterbacks. I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, look, at 5,400 and with 14 rushing attempts at quarterback, absolutely justifiable. I think it's fine. I just liked what I saw a little bit more out of Daniels. Um, and in, then in terms of the matchup, like, Devin said, Sam Darnold just torched that Giants defense. So uh, the only other thing you could do if the injuries continue to pile up would be Lamar Jackson at 7,700. But right now there's just no reason uh, to pay $1,500 more because the projections have him and Daniels pretty close. Do those projections have Anthony Richardson in a similar ballpark? I mean, we know that that Packers defense has been able to be taken advantage of. Uh, for me, it's it's Daniels, Jackson. Those two for raw projections by a pretty good margin. Okay. Um, you know, I would say like three points or so. So for, for the money, I don't think Richardson makes sense for cash again. I have those guys projected about the – about the same as Richardson. Um, they're both around 20 DraftKings points, um, but you're saving money with going cheaper. Yeah. So I think that difference, and they're, they're all volatile. I mean, on any of these rushing guys, if they don't have the rushing game, who's going to get the rushing touchdown is always a big one. So like that's sort of unpredictable. So I'll just go with the cheaper guys. 
All right, time for our running backs. And Phil, who are you putting next to Jordan Mason in your lineup, assuming Christian McCaffrey's out? Yeah, so Jordan Mason, obvious free square at 5,200, provided McCaffrey is out. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday evening. He was a limited participant in practice, but I think the tea leaves uh, are pretty clear when Adam Schefter is saying a week in advance that he's probably going to be out for week two. Uh, so, yeah, you don't have to be told to play Jordan Mason at that price. Uh, it gets interesting after that. So there's a couple ways that you could go. Kyron Williams at 6,800. I'm surprised that he saw 91% of the snaps and 91% of the backfield touches in week one. So the, the type of workload, the type of playing time that he's seeing is consistent with what he had last year. The question now becomes he's got his left guard and his left tackle on injured reserve. So is that offensive line going to be a problem? Uh, I think maybe, and I think that there's a lot of other well-priced Rams. So do you want to play Williams in cash? And do you then want to turn around and play him with like two or other th or three other Rams? I would say maybe not. Um, so for me, I would want to find, if I could, the extra 600 to get up to Brees Hall. Um, I think the Jets are going to look a lot better than they did against San Francisco facing Tennessee. Brees Hall was the only back on the field and the only back getting touches when Aaron Rodgers was in the game. He was really one of like three players on the offense that's getting touches along with Garrett Wilson and Alan Lazard. I mean, that was a tight, tight distribution of touches there for the Jets. Active in the passing game, active at the goal line. Uh, I don't think we'll see him under 8K again all season. And uh, th then you have another contingency because Kenneth Walker missed practice today with an oblique injury. If you get Zach Charbonnet at 5,800 and you could, you could pair him then, even in a you know not so great matchup against the Patriots and a not so great game environment, I think Charbonnet with a full workload put him next to Mason. And now you could do things like Cooper Cup and CeeDee Lamb together uh, in your cash game lineup, which is, is pretty enticing. So uh, waiting to see the news on Charbonnet, but otherwise I'm looking for Brees Hall next to Mason. Devin, you're one of my favorite Buckeyes. And another one of my favorite Buckeyes is J.K. Daniels at 5,400 playing Carolina. J.K. Dobbins, yes. J.K. Dobbins at 5,400 playing Carolina. Am I crazy here or is it maybe for cash? It's not crazy. I think it depends on your roster build. Um, he's certainly in my player pool. Um, as far as options, Carolina's run defense has been horrendous for the last at least two seasons. And it's a big reason why I like Dalvin Kamara last week. So I think um, Dobbins is certainly in play. And, and he was a name that I was going to mention. Mason is obviously the the top play. I expect him to be nearly 100% rostered in, in cash. Brees Hall will talk about, um, particularly for GPPs. But I think at 7400 the price is more than fair. I personally hate the matchup against Tennessee. I think Tennessee's front looked really good last week um, against Chicago, and maybe that's just Chicago, but they were stacking the box and relying heavily on their one-on-one -on -one coverage on the outside. So there could be some of that going on again, but at 7,400, he's going to be very popular and probably it gets into game gameplay. I don't want to call it game theory because it's not game theory, but it's um, – you know, how your game strategy, um, do I really want to be on an, on an island when everyone is playing Brees Hall? And probably not. I would re probably rather just play a lineup that I'll find differentiators elsewhere because Brees Hall, I think, as we all know, is one of the more volatile backs in the NFL. He had seven games last year where he ran for under 30 yards. Um, but he gets a lot of his work through the air. So I... I'll probably play him in cash. I don't love it, but certainly with how popular he's going to be, it's probably just a plug and play for me this week. So it's depending on where you want to go with receivers, it's probably Mason Hall and then Dobbins would be my third. But 
I'm okay with Kyron Williams as well. More, probably more of a GPP play. Um, you could go Kyron in cup and get like 70 to 80% of the touches within the, with the Rams. We'll talk about other guys that are cheap as well, but a lot of volume is going to be going to those two guys. So um, it's not a bad strategy. If you think they're going to put up 20 plus points to take the guys that are going to be getting 70 plus percent of the, the work. Yeah, no, I, I like all those calls. I think that those are great. Uh, wide receivers, you talk about the Rams. I mean, Phil, for me, I'm seeing Cooper Cup at 7,700, and I have a hard time building any lineup that doesn't have Cooper Cup at 7,700 in it. Uh, is that kind of where your mind is for that Rams-Cardinals game too, or are you, what else are you looking at for this week? Yeah, he's almost just as much of a lock button as Jordan Mason, in my opinion, because his price should be right there with Lambs and Jefferson, so you're getting – you know, a, a solid savings in terms of the salary. He had 21 targets last week without Nakua in the lineup. Uh, we could very well be looking at his 2021 season or 90% thereof um, before we know it. So, yeah, you want Cup in your lineup. Um, th- there's a lot of wide receiver options and a lot of ways that you could go depending on how these builds shake out with the injuries. Um, I'll just kind of quickly rattle off some names, but Debo Samuel had great usage uh, without McCaffrey last week, nine targets, eight rush attempts, rushing touchdown. Uh, He could very easily be the guy that breaks the slate, and he's sub 7K on DraftKings. Um, Rasheed Rice, I think, is in play. Uh, Just watching him last week get all of those uh, slants and watching him get that separation off the line and the way Mahomes was looking for him, um, he could definitely be like a PPR god. There's no... Hollywood Brown again this week, I don't think. Um, so there's no challenge to that type of target volume that he could get. Um, and then there's a, there, there's a bunch of guys. I mean, I don't think Malik Neighbors is bad at 5,900 for cash. Daniel Jones is the concern there. But Baker Mayfield, Devin's boy, looked kind of like Joe Montana last week against the same Washington defense. So um, not ruling out that neighbors could clear 100 yards, given that he's very likely to get at least 20% of the targets. Uh, Chris Godwin in that same range. Uh, and then you could even go down. Um, I think Lad McConkey is cash viable. Demarcus Robinson at 4,000 might be the best value play on the slate. So a lot of wide receiver options. Um, if, if I was trying to like lock them in right now, it's probably for me, Cup, Godwin and Debo, depending again on on what happens at the end of the week with these injuries. So let's talk about a guy. I don't know. He's thirty three hundred. Alan Lazard. Yeah, six for eighty nine, two touchdowns. We're going to get to a tight end section in a minute. My my worry about Rasheed Rice is they're going to see that tape on those slants and just game plan to try and take Rasheed Rice out of the game. And then it opens up something for Travis Kelsey. Um, so do they, you know, you're kind of, for the, for the Bengals, you kind of have to figure out what way they're going to go. And I think the differential that I see is more of a Kelsey game, but um, I don't know. I, I, I think at 3,300, I like taking these guys and Lazard hasn't blown up as far as popularity just yet. I think he's going to be much more popular as the week goes on. Maybe people don't think that they need the 3,300 of salary just yet, but I personally love taking the guys on Monday night who blow up in cash the following week because the pricing hasn't reflected that. The pricing comes out, what, Sunday night, something like that. So it's already out when the Monday night games are going on. Um, we know that the history there is is solid uh, with, with Aaron Rodgers, so he's certainly a guy that I would, I would strongly consider. Um, Debo is another guy that was on my list. Cooper Cup was on my list. Um, going down, I, I need to see more from Chris Godwin than one game, personally, at 6K. I understand the call, um, but it's – he was just such second fiddle in that offense last year that it worries me. Um, 
And then I think if you want, if you're afraid of Lazard, I think Demarcus Robinson is fine. Again, it's the, the shares of, of that offense are going to be limited given the, the loss of Nakua. Maybe it's all cup, but maybe it's not. Um, but I think for me, it's Lazard, Debo, and Cup in cash this week. Yeah, I'll, just give I like quick, I'll give you a quick rebuttal on, on Chris Godwin, uh, because even though it was one game, we know what he's capable of as a, a primary slot receiver previously in his career. Uh, he returned to the slot, which was a continuation of a drumbeat coming out of camp, and it was a 27% target share in his first game there. Um, so I, I think that they realize how to use him. Uh, and or I, Washington's I defense is just so bad that, like, you can throw to whoever. Could very it's well be. But the difference between Washington and Detroit. But I, I understand the point. Um, we, did ju- we did just see – I mean, he is Cooper Cup, but we did just see Cup eat up Detroit from the slot as well. We, we have a difference. Carlton Davis revenge game lurking for the Lions. So the Lions cornerback Carlton Davis, former Buccaneer. So I'm just saying. We'll talk about Mike Evans in the GPP section. <laughs> I, I think Lazard is an interesting call out there, though. And and with Aaron Rodgers at the helm, only three players are allowed to touch the ball. Brees Hall, Garrett Wilson, and Elm Lazard because it's Aaron Rodgers. He needs one so. long catch and he pays off 3300 It's like the b- barrier That's... to paying off is so low. The that or if you want to... The Alan Lazard experience as a Jets fan was was something else the other night. You know, it went from those that first drop to what in the world is he still doing on the team to oh hey Alan Lazard is is back, isn't he? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And then Tyler Johnson also at thirty three hundred. If you wanted to pivot in the similar range, I think he's going to be dominating Pukanikua's snaps at least. But that doesn't mean he's going to be touching the ball very often. But we can move to tight ends now and. Uh, what do you have a strategy on tight ends here? Are we there's a couple. I think injuries have opened up opportunity for maybe some cheaper players here, or you know, it was kind of a not a boom week for elite tight end strategy last week. Yeah, I'm taking Travis Kelsey at 61, 6200 because I'm going Lazard. I can afford it because I'm going cheap at quarterback. Look, I, he has. I mean, he struggled in a couple of these season openers. Uh, or early on in the season, maybe he struggles again, but you know, as long as he's still in the league, he should be higher priced than Sam Laporta and Trey McBride. And he's in the same range as those two guys. So I think he's, I think he's too cheap. I think that the um, opportunities of having a huge game where he could single-handedly win you a, a cash game week, probably just him in, Kittle, maybe Laporta can get there on some weeks, but certainly I think Kittle and Kelsey are the the two guys with the highest upside based on past history. But I I don't know. I I think him coming off of a bad game is certainly miles above some of these other guys. And, you know, he's not that much more expensive than even like the Evan Ingrams and the Mark Andrews of the world. So at 6,200, it's more than affordable uh, given the – lack of premier options on this slate. I, I'm i sure Phil is going to say Colby Parkinson. Uh, there's no way I'm going that, that route. <laughs> I, just... I thought Colby Parkinson looked pretty good. Uh, if, if he could give me another four for 47 at 3,100 on DraftKings, I'm, I'm happy with the price. And, you know, with that target tree consolidating like we've talked about, I don't think it's, it's out of the question. Um, Stafford uses his tight ends. Uh, historically a bit. And um, he is another one coming off a good camp. So it was a little bit of evidence, you know, that we gained that, uh, that there was some truth to it. Uh, The only thing that may have me moving in a different direction, again, is just the number of Rams that I'm putting in this lineup. I mean, I feel queasy if there's like three players from the same team uh, in a cash game lineup, right? Because the risk is getting elevated. I don't think I don't think that's true. I mean, the upside the upside becomes a bit limited or riskier. I'll say not limited. The mm-hmm. floor certainly is. I would say higher. They're going to score points, right? And then we know where those we know where those targets are going to come from. 
are, do we really see a situation where the Rams put up 10 points? Like, I, I don't. So, you no, know, you're not happening. Taking two or three of these guys isn't like because their value plays, they're not, it's not the worst thing in the world to do. Yep. The, the only uh, other play for my build anyway, because I don't have room for Kelsey, who I think is an awesome play. I'm going to have a lot of them in tournaments. Um, Jordan Aikens at 3000 is about the same price as Parkinson. Uh, he's going to be stepping in for David and Joku this week. Uh, Deshaun Watson is very familiar with him from their time together in Houston. He's uh, a pass catching tight end. Uh, and the, the bar for being a, uh, a tight end on DraftKings is is pretty darn low. Uh, and hey, at least Cleveland isn't playing Dallas again this week. Can't get worse. I mean, you had a you know, I was thinking Jordan Jordan uh, Aikens as well, but maybe a little bit more GFP. Devin, I saw you crack a smile there. What what is your I got called a Browns hater last week, which was kind of funny <laughs> because I'm a season ticket holder, but this team stinks. Like they <laughs> they they have three guys going out on IR um, on defense. Their offensive line, they're missing both their tackles. Deshaun Watson, like, who the hell knows? Uh, Jordan Akins, like, okay, fine. I, I don't have any issues with it. If you told me Amari Cooper or Jerry Judy, I might throw this coffee across the room. But, like, <laughs> um, or if you said Jerome Ford, who's, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not I'm not going to turn this into a Browns podcast, but I I think this team is in for a long season. I do want to ask at 4800 Isaiah Likely. If Isaiah Likely, do you think where do you think that roster ship is going to come in at? And if he does what he did last week, I mean, is that a, a problem for uh, people that don't have that? Right now. His roster percentage is low, and we can talk about it in GPPs, but like, I think it's because people are still looking at him as the second tight end and still looking at him as, hey, Mark Andrews is still there. Zay Flowers is still there. They're still running the ball a lot. Um, but in whether or not this was a case where, hey, it just kept, it just worked, so you're just going to keep going back until the defense can stop it. I look at likely a little bit more than that. I think that, you know, Mark Andrews has had injury after injury after injury, whatever. He's coming off of the um, broken leg or whatever he had last year. So I I look at it as could likely emerge as a role, as, you know, could they have a two tight ends um, have roles in this offense? Yeah, I think, I think it's certainly possible. It's a risk. Probably too much for cash for me at 4,800. I think you either go down to those two guys that Phil mentioned or you go up to Kelsey or even like a a Kittle at 5,500 with no McCaffrey is probably a better play. He's just in this weird pricing zone where tight ends are a little more smushed together than what they used to be. Like normally he would be, historically, he would be like 4,100. And like David Njoku has been throughout like his entire career. So... I don't know. I think I think he's more of a GPP play than a than a cash game play this week. Sure. All right. Make sure to head to footballguys.com forward slash plans to become a Hall of Fame subscriber. Hall of Fame subscribers get access to all DFS content for less than twenty dollars monthly or ninety five dollars annually. I don't know. Are do we still have that special going on? I know last week we had a special for the season to start, but if you're not a subscriber, check that out and you know we give you great plays and and. Let's win some money together. But uh, now we can go into GPP plays here and we can talk about quarterbacks and, and Phil, how many Rams are you going to put in a GPP? Are you looking at Matthew Stafford as a potential quarterback option? Uh, yeah, I think you have to play Matthew Stafford if you're, if you're playing all those Rams. So he'll definitely have a place in some of my lineups, but um, I, I think actually the, uh, the mention of likely is a good segue into my GPP quarterbacks because Lamar Jackson looked as dangerous as ever uh, in in week one running the ball. Um, at 7,700, I, I think he is certainly in play. And, and where I think that likely comes in, I agree with Devin, he's a GPP play, but it allows you, I mean, if you take Jackson's salary, 7,700, and you add it 
to likelies at 4,800, uh, you're going to end up spending less money on the stack than the other high end uh, quarterback pass catcher stack. So like Mahomes Rice is going to be more expensive. Even Jared Goff, who's comparatively cheap at 6,400, you put him with Amon Ross St. Brown, for example, you know, you're paying more than you would with um, uh, Lamar Jackson and Isaiah Likely. So um, from that standpoint, I'm, I'm willing to take a bet on that connection continuing because we know that Likely is a talented player and, you know, he, he received the playing time. I don't know why he wouldn't again. Uh, so while maybe he's not going to do what he did against the Chiefs, I don't know why he couldn't continue to show out. Um, and it, it makes rostering Lamar Jackson that much easier uh, to, to fit under the cap. Uh, but other than that, I would say Mahomes in GPPs, especially paired with Kelsey, uh, as Devin pointed out, uh, looks especially good. I think you got to get some Mahomes in your life just about every week this year. Uh, that offense looks pretty incredible, and I'm excited to see what they could do against the defense that's not the Ravens. Uh, we know the drill with Jared Goff, uh, who I just mentioned. Uh, you play him in the dome when the team is a heavy favorite, and he usually comes through. Uh, this is a rematch of a game we saw in last year's playoffs where Goff was essentially perfect and the game totaled 54 points. Uh, so I think that the 300-yard bonus and two or three touchdowns is very much in play. And uh, the only guy I think I'm sneaking past anyone might be Dak Prescott. I had mentioned I like that Cowboys Saints game. I don't think that anyone's going to be looking to play Dak much this week, um, but I think it could be it could be kind of sneaky because what if what we saw from the Saints in Week One, while it had a lot to do with the Carolina Panthers defense, uh, they have a, a whole new offensive scheme under Clint Kubiak, uh, who really did like bring that offense into the 21st century. Um, they, they were doing a lot of modern concepts, things that they just were not doing under Pete Carmichael uh, last year when he was the offensive coordinator. So, you know, if, if they could put some pressure on Dallas, now you have Dak, you're obviously going to pair him with CeeDee Lamb, whose ceiling is as high as anyone's on the slate. Um, so I, I think that that is definitely another good way to attack GPPs. It's expensive, that stack, but... Um, you could definitely build around it this week. There's enough value. You have other plays, Devin? Yeah. Um, Joe Burrow. Nobody wants to play him this week. Uh, <laughs> 6,300. And in his four career games against the, the Chiefs, he has thrown for 250 yards or more in every single game. So um, perfect stack opportunity uh, with Jamar Chase. Not all that expensive. And I think it's a game that a lot of people are looking at it and saying, oh, the, the Bengals look terrible. They did. But think about how much turnover or how much volatility they had last week. Was Chase going to play? Was Higgins going to play? So much. Like now they know, unless Chase just pulls like, hey, I'm not playing week two. But again, we're recording on Wednesday. All signs are pointing towards him playing, T. Higgins not, whatever. Um I think it's a great opportunity for Burrow. He's right now he's projected to be less than one percent rostered, uh, which is just in my mind too low. Um, you know, certainly three hundred yard upside and uh, getting back on track. The other guy that I'm looking at, again, looking at kind of these bottom of the barrel type guys um, as far as roster percentage goes. I'm going to look at Derek Carr at fifty three hundred. Again, it goes to Phil's philosophy of shooting out. And what if the Browns are just that terrible? Um, we know Jerron Bland is out for quite some time for Dallas. Uh, Cleveland's issue was Deshaun Watson just held on the ball way too long. He had 4.2 seconds per play, uh, per pass attempt. If Derek Carr is 4.2 seconds, I will gladly take that uh, with the Chris Olave stack or an Alvin Kamara. So if this game shoots out, um, certainly you could have the other side put CD lamb back in coming back. I think that that's a, a more than acceptable deep stack. Obviously, if you're looking at the top, I think Justin Fields, even at 15%, like he, he has the potential just to break the slate and any given week. So 
uh, as does Jaden Daniels. I don't think Daniels has as much upside at, than Fields. Um, certainly, I think Daniels has a higher floor than Fields. But does Jaden Daniels have that 150-yard upside that we've seen Fields have as far as rushing goes? I don't think so. Is Pittsburgh going to let Fields do that, like Bill's mentioned? Maybe, maybe not. But carrying the ball 14 times is certainly intriguing. So if I'm going to go up, it's going to be just up to Fields and in, in moving on with my life. Stafford is interesting, and I know we're running a little bit long in this section, but I don't think you have to stack Stafford with some with these Rams guys because the the target share is so concentrated that if he throws for 250 and two, you could still have Cooper Cup have 130 yards and two touchdowns and Colby Parkinson have 65 yards and a touchdown. Like, I guess that would be three touchdowns for Stafford. Whatever. You get the <laughs> point. You get the point, right? It's like he doesn't have to throw for 300 yards for this to work because it's it's such a narrow stack, and you can be different by taking a cheap Cup, a cheap Parkinson, or a cheap Demarcus Robinson, and still get around it because their target share is so narrow. Um, and I, I think the same thing with the Jets too, with Garrett Wilson and Alan, Alan Lazard is that their target share is narrow. So Rogers doesn't have to have a big game in order for Olave or Lazard to have a big, or Brees Hall to have a big game, for example. There's a triangle of terrible down kind of at the very bottom where you're looking at some matchups, some skill sets, some ridiculousness, and you have a, a Sam Darnold potential revenge game against his former team, the 49ers with a lot of fun pieces on that 49er side. And, you know, Justin Jefferson there with Darnold, you have the Daniel Jones experience going up against a horrible commander's defense, but Jones is a player that can run and you can link him with Malik neighbors and you don't know what's going to happen. And then Malik Willis, if you're going to talk about guys that can run again, that Packers Colts shoot out for 5,000 bottom of the barrel, they are all terrible decisions, but I'm just saying that if you're sc- scraping down be, there, that I, I think DraftKings needs to lower the floor uh, floor of a starting quarterback. Like if they were like 44, 4,500, I think it would be a lot more intriguing. But like the yeah. difference between, I don't know, who, who did you mention? Sam Darnold at fifty two hundred versus Sam Darnold fifty two hundred, Daniel Jones fifty three hundred, and Malik Willis at five thousand flat. Right. So it's like you can find seven hundred dollars to go to Baker Mayfield or two hundred dollars to go to Justin Fields. I think it would be fun if they were like 43 or 44, knowing how terrible Malik Willis is. Then it's a real decision, but not, not at 5k. Moving into running backs. I think me, if we're projecting Justin Fields to be highly played is a potential pivot to Najee Harris, given how much usage we saw last week just for Najee Harris and kind of making the argument that if he's picking up the rushing and if there are, if this offense does ever score a touchdown this year, maybe it is Najee Harris instead of Justin Fields. Yeah, I think that's fine. I I think that, I mean, look, if if Najee is running the ball well, they're going to continue to do that. And, you know, they, they don't want to throw Justin Fields out there 14 times a game run, running the ball. And that's not a sustainable methodolo- methodology to keep your quarterback slash potential backup quarterback safe uh, over a 17 game season. So I think, I think it's a fine pivot. What other plays are you looking at for GPPs for running backs? Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, 7,700. Um, we saw what Saquon did. Uh, he's expensive, and I think that's going to drive a lot of people away from from him this week. Um, Ramondre, no, I'm not going to Ramondre Stevenson. I, I like the player. The matchup is still TBD with how, how Denver performed. I think Zach Charbonnet, if Ken, Kenneth Walker is out, is, is intriguing. Um, bounce back for Josh Jacobs. So Indy's, Indy's run defense looked terrific. Joe Mixon ran for, what, 5.5 yards a carry or something last week, which, if that's the case, 
if Joe Mixon can run for that, certainly Josh Jacobs can, even though he looked terrible. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, we've talked about Hall. We've talked about Mason. I, I've given my little spiel about I think Hall's overpriced. Um, I'll just jump in. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to jump in and say that um, – I'm sorry. Who was the last name that uh, that you had said before, Kyron Williams? Brees Hall. Mm, back up one more. This is broadcasting excellence. For Josh me. Jacobs. Yeah, Char- Charbonnet, Josh <laughs> Jacobs, <laughs> Ronda Stevenson. Ah, I'm sorry. Guys. It'll it'll come to me, but we'll we'll move on to uh, to my tournament running backs here. Uh, so I mentioned Patrick Mahomes. And I like the idea of a Mahomes double stack. What I think less people tend to do, especially when it's not a pass catching running back is stack the quarterback and the running back. So on teams where I'm going to have Mahomes and Kelsey, I'm also going to sneak some in with Isaiah Pacheco, uh, not only to monopolize the chiefs touchdowns, which I think are going to be numerous, uh, but Pacheco ran 22 routes and received 13.6% of the targets last week, 85% of the backfield touches. This is usage that was not typical Isaiah Pacheco usage last season. It's not what I expected after they signed Samaj P. Ryan, and maybe he's still getting up to speed, uh, which could have had something to do with it. So there there could be a little bit of volatility there. But if that keeps up, um, Pacheco as a, a home favorite, I think, looks good inside of Patrick Mahomes stacks. And pretty good in general. Uh, Jeff last week mentioned James Conner as a good play against Buffalo, and, and that was a good call. Uh, he was only about 6% owned in the uh, in the slant on DraftKings, and uh, he was at 76% of the backfield touches, only came off the field in obvious passing situations. He was active as a runner and receiver because they were throwing the running backs a lot on the early downs. Um, 19 DraftKings points, I thought he looked pretty good. Uh, he could be your run back in some of those uh, Rams centric lineups. Uh, Jameer Gibbs at 6,600, because just like Patrick Mahomes, you always want to have some Jameer Gibbs sprinkled into your tournament lineups, right? Uh, Detroit's at home, high scoring game. And we saw both Gibbs and Montgomery getting uh, high leverage touches. Um, so while they do cap each other's upside a bit, uh, Gibbs is the one that obviously runs with a little bit more electricity, even though that last drive in uh, overtime by Montgomery uh, was, was very impressive in, in last week's game. Uh, but I like Gibbs. Ramondre Stevenson was on my list. I guess it depends on, uh, you know, they, they were able to control the game script and do everything they wanted to do against Cincinnati. Are they going to do that again at home this week against Seattle? Probably not, but they're going to try, uh, and and he's involved in all phases. And at 6,200, I think people might still be a, a little bit leery of him. Um, so that that was my list. Aaron Jones at 6,100. There was a little bit of a story that the Vikings were kind of trying to get him to 100 yards week one. I think Aaron Jones is incredibly motivated this year. He was, he was pretty upset with how things went down in Green Bay, and the Vikings seemed very willing to – allow him to accumulate stats and, and you know, that 49ers game has the potential to shoot out. If Sam Darnold can hold his water a little bit to be able to keep them going there, Ezekiel Elliott at 5,700 going up against the saints in a potential high scoring game. There's a chance that, you know, I think Ezekiel Elliott owns the goal line work. And if he is the pivot there where he gets into the end zone a couple times, I think that that could be a big playoff in a tournament. Um, I think I love the Isaiah Pacheco call out. I was going to say that one, Phil, and and that I think that was I was surprised too because I expected Samaj P Ryan to kind of grab that passing down roll, but he got a rep in early against uh, pass protection and biffed it, and Mahomes got hit, and they kind of mm-hmm. benched him after that a, a little bit. I think is what happened there, but um, we can move to wide receivers now, Devin. What are you going for wide receivers in your GPP lineups? Yeah, uh, so GPPs. Um, a lot of the same guys, but we'll get to, we'll get to some other guys that, that I'm also looking for. So one of my favorites this week is a St. Brown at 8,100. Um, I think Jameis Williams is going to get some love here, but I still think this is a offense at 
Um, and he's going to, he's certainly going to bounce back after what seemed to be a, a horrendous game last week. Um, I talked about Jamar Chase. Devontae Adams is interesting at 7,300. I, I, I continue just to think he goes overlooked um, almost every week. He's a better receiver than he is at, than, than at 70, 7,300. He's going to be less than 5% rostered. I know we only had six targets last week, which is a little concerning. Um, I would like to see that increase. <clears throat> but, you know, are, are they really going to throw the ball to Brock Bowers eight times and Alexander Madison six times? So <clears throat> I think that I think water finds its level a little bit. Um, anyway, um, moving on. Uh, those dogs just completely threw me off. Alan Lazard, again, I talked about him. Not going to rehash that. And then Chris Olave, just most of the guys I've already mentioned. Phil, no. do you get your you ready one, to, one to talk or your, your dog's still barking? Sorry, here. One more. Um, well, Phil gets his dog situation under control. Brian Thomas for Jacksonville. Um, going up against Cleveland. Again, this Cleveland defense is so bad. They, they had three guys put on IR today um, that were starters. Yeah, they have Miles Garrett, but I I said it last week. They averaged 28 points allowed per game over the last five weeks last year. So they started off really well. Um, it was the backbone of that defense and our backbone of that team. And then they really sputtered, and it certainly looks like they're going to sputter this year. So. I, I think until further notice, it should be do not be afraid to play people against the Browns. And at 4,800, I mean, Brian Thomas is as athletic as any receiver in this class, not named Xavier Worthy or Malik Neighbors. Um, and maybe Xavier Worthy's in play too. I, I'm sure Phil might mention him based on what we saw in loving the Chiefs, but um, I certainly think he is a play, certainly big upside. And then let's go another rookie. Adonai Mitchell uh, should have caught at least a touchdown, maybe two. Um, has as much speed as anybody um, in this in this class. Yep, I second a couple of those calls for sure. Uh, definitely on Ad Mitchell. Uh, you know, some of those long balls that got completed to Alec Pierce could just as easily go to Mitchell this week. A couple of them should have last week, the way that Devin said. Uh, we saw A.J. Brown get behind that Green Bay defense easily enough. Uh, Mitchell, you know, is, is not in that class, but he does have size and speed to give them trouble. Uh, St. Brown was also on my list to pair with Goff. Uh, I like Garrett Wilson a lot at 7,100. Um, you know, over 50% of the air yards and 38% of the targets went to Wilson last week. And Aaron Rodgers came out of that game saying that they need to get Wilson the ball more. So I don't know what that looks like, but I'll definitely pay 7,100 to find out if they're going to target him more somehow. Um, I, I do envision them having more passing success than they did last week. Um, I, I think Wilson is going to show everyone why he snuck into the first round of season-long leagues this year. Uh, Amari Cooper, just so Devin could possibly throw that coffee. I, I do like him in tournaments. I mean, no one had more air yards last week. And, and I know that these are like the air yard varieties that, um, you know, that like don't count the same as normal air yards. Like a Deshaun Watson air yard is like, a 25% of an air yard these days. Uh, but no one had more air yards than Amari Cooper's 170 last week. Uh, we saw the Jags let up an 80 yard touchdown to Tyreek Hill. Uh, they also let up a big game to Waddle. Um, you know, it's one of two things, right? The Browns are that bad, very likely. But is there a 20% chance that maybe the Cowboys defense is that good? And we kind of know that Jacksonville's isn't. Um, so I could picture someone like Amari Cooper. I mean, the guy's the definition of a professional wide receiver. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a couple shots. 
I'm now very fascinated at the idea of a sliding scale for air yards for quarterbacks. <laughs> I think we need to get Dan Hendry working on that to give, give us a quarterback scale for what what is the value of a air yard relative for Josh Allen versus Deshaun, Jack, Deshaun Watson. I mean, look, David and Joku's out, so like, or looks That's like it. he's gonna miss. Yeah, I. Cooper just didn't separate at all. And maybe that's because like Trayvon Diggs is good, but like a lot of those air yards were just like, is it, is it, I don't know how air yards are calculated clearly um, because I don't care about it as a stat, but are, are they completed passes or are they targets? It's both. Oh, targets. Com- it's targets basically. Okay. So it can so be completed passes. John Watson overthrowing him on the sideline, trying to scramble for his life. Like that, that shouldn't count for anything. <laughs> Um, well, well, like last year when Chris Olave would just run nine routes and have like yeah. 200 unrealized air yards because Derek Carr would miss him by seven yards every single time. So that yeah. that's so, what a, an air yard is. Yeah, I, I don't I don't put a lot of value into air yards. I know some people do. Um, it's funny. It's predictive until it's not the uh, the creator of air yards, Josh Hermsmeyer, when he first kind of um, put that stat out there and, and ran a weekly column on it. Um, he redacted, um, God, what was the huge wide receiver's name on Carolina Steve from Calvin FSU? Benjamin. Calvin Benjamin. He redacted Calvin Benjamin every week because no matter how many air yards he had, uh, it never proved predictive for Calvin Benjamin. So the same thing might be true of Amari Cooper uh, and Deshaun Watson, but I think we know enough about Amari Cooper that uh, that we could take a shot. He's got upside. Uh, and the last name on my list is last week's busted chalk, Andre Iosivas, uh, at 3,800. Uh, so I think if Devin sees some value in Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati passing game, uh, I think you could go back there. I mean, Yosivas had uh, tied for the team lead in targets last week. He was out there on every snap. He was running every route. T. Higgins is going to be out again this week, I'm fairly certain. Uh, so I could see that working out this week at a much lower uh, percent rostered. Zay Flowers, I think last week, show, like Zay Flowers has 10 catch upside. And I think that that kind of the way they used him, both the short game and some deep plays on that play game last week against the Chiefs. I mean, that's a player I think has the potential to be able to go off. DK Metcalf at 5,900, that feels cheap relative to what DK Metcalf could potentially give you. I know the Patriots are a difficult matchup, or we think they are a difficult matchup, but that's lingering right there. Jaden Reed at 6,000, that is obviously playing with Malik Willis, but he's the type of player that has shown the ability to contribute out of the backfield and kind of some of these Over under on Malik teams. Willis passing yards, 107. Well, how many air uh, yards? No, completed <laughs> passing yards. I put it at like 110. I was going to say, is that the real Vegas no, line, I can, or I can get the real line? But I, I would have, I would, I would put. Well, it but but Jane like Reed can rush for another 65 yards, so I mean, there, that's in play too. Like it's, you know, we're 52 minutes into weeks. this show, and we're talking about just complete nonsense. <laughs> Squeaky wheel theory, Marvin Harrison Jr. Kind of, there was a little bit of news today on Wednesday about Marvin Harrison Jr. Just kind of saying, if you're looking at that shootout game with the Rams, uh, Jameson Williams, I know Devin, you mentioned him at 5,300. And then Greg Dortch down at the bottom. If you're not going to do Marvin Harrison Jr., 4,600 for Greg Dortch. If you kind of want to say, well, maybe Harrison is done in this offense. That's a pretty cheap price tag for a guy that could lead the team in targets. Tight ends. Anything else for GPPs for tight ends? Anybody got anything? Let's toss it out there. I've got Trey McBride at 6,000. That'd be my preferred target um, when we're looking to stack that game. And really, I, I, I do like Kelsey as well. But along with Kelsey, I think he's a great bet to bounce back amongst those high priced tight ends. He had a 38% target share last week. Uh, he finished behind only Isaiah Likely. Uh, in those air yards amongst tight ends. Uh, So I think it's going to get better than eight DraftKings points for him pretty soon. Uh, And then on the low side, I like Greg Dulcich, uh, 2,900. So he's a total punt. Uh, 66% of the snaps last week was what I was hoping for, uh, and it came to fruition. Uh, He ran the most pass routes on the team. 
besides uh, the receivers, Cortland Sutton and, and Josh Reynolds. Reynolds, by the way, is on the injury report. Um, Vele, their rookie who had eight targets last week, is on the injury report. And this is a talented tight end who had a, a really rare rookie season for the position. Uh, and, you know, he's kind of like out of our collective consciousness, but uh, I think he's talented. Bo Nix obviously looked terrible, but, you know, could he get to the, the ball to his tight end a bunch of times on short passes? And could Dulcich make something happen after the catch? I, I think it's totally possible. Anything else? Yeah, Kevin? I mean, the only other, name I'll, only other name I'll throw, I'm fading Brock Bowers. He's going to be the most popular guy. I understand why he's 4,400 and he had eight targets last week, but I'm not trusting, I'm not trusting a rookie tight end uh, who is the most popular guy on the slate. Uh, George Kittle is the guy that I would be looking at in GPPs at 5,500. I talked about like who has upside that could just break the slate and be the guy that you want to have. And, you know, I look at what tight ends could catch 60, 70 yard passes. And that's certainly Kittle. Um, going up against a Minnesota defense that they're okay. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not certainly the, the cream of the crop, but they've struggled against the past in, in the last couple of years. So I think that he's, he's certainly in play, especially with McCaffrey out. This Packers Colts game is like a bug lamp for me. Like I'm just like the bright light, but uh, Tucker Crafts is like a near every down tight end at, at 3,300. So just, how many how many Packers are you pl- Jordan Love's not playing, you know that, right? I don't know. I don't know, Devin. I don't know how many Packers I want to play. I just it's, it's I told you it's like a bug light. It's like a you know the, the it's light in the tunnel and I don't know if it's a train or the light at the other side. So have you seen Malik Willis play football? Yes, I have. Yes, unfortunately, I have seen I'm Malik staying Willis the hell away from that game. Oh, that reminds me. That's what I forgot a moment ago. Um, what was interesting to me about what David said back in the running back section about 10 minutes ago, um, Josh Jacobs is an interesting decision point, right? Because on one hand, they might load him up for like 35 carries. But on the other, you've got Malik Willis, right? Like totally stalling the offense. So like, can they show Mixon drives? ran it 30 times, right? So like. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, that, that workload could really be there for Jacobs. It's just that, you know, if he can't make something happen, what, what is it going to amount to? Uh, but it's it's an interesting one this week for sure, something something to think about. Yeah, I mean, the Packers schedule isn't overly easy. It's home against the Colts at the Titans, which, like, that should be a win, but with Malik Willis, who, who knows? Home against the Vikings and then at the Rams. So who knows when Jordan Love gets back, but you can't start – one in four. I think this is a must win game for the Packers. I thought I heard LaFleur say that he didn't rule love out for this week, which would obviously be, it would be shocking. But I think that um, the takeaway there is that he probably won't be out longer term. He'll, he'll make the shorter side of that injury timetable. I'm absolutely amazed by how many, how often we see a player on Monday or on Sunday, like there's going to be out multiple weeks. And then two days later, it's like, yeah, you might play football this week. It's just like, <laughs> and I'm also horrified at that idea because pharmaceuticals like, what man. is happening to these players to be able to do that. But yes. Um, now stacks, favorite stacks, Devin, what's your favorite stack for this week? Um, Favorite stack is, I mean, the obvious one is Matthew Stafford, Cooper cup. But um, I'm going to go off the board here a little bit. Jared Goff and Amonra St. Brown. I think Tennessee's Tennessee's run defense is pretty good. You know, Vita Vea up the middle. I know De- I know Detroit is built to run the ball with their offensive line, who Matt Batanti has as the number one offensive line for football guys. Um, so, but I think it's a pass. It's a pass game for them. I think they get back on on track through the air with with St. Brown. What do you got, Phil? I'm going to stack the Rams-Cardinals game from the Cardinals side. I'm going to go Kyler Murray, Trey McBride, and then run it back with any number of Rams players who are all severely underpriced. And I also mentioned the um, Lamar Jackson, Isaiah Likely stack for tournaments. I think there's good value there. And uh, you could even play it with Andrews, you know, and and – maybe go like full contrarian because 
I don't think anybody's looking to play him at, at $200 more than, uh, than likely. And, you know, it's a little narrative driven, but maybe he's been, um, he's been reading the news clippings about how he's washed up and done and likely he's the new star in town and maybe they'll go out of their way to get him more involved. Everybody knows I love a revenge narrative and maybe it's a small revenge narrative, but to CM Darnold, Aaron Jones, Justin Jefferson, play it back the other way with Debo Samuel, Jordan Mason, and just hope that things go crazy in that 49ers uh, Vikings game, I think is a little bit interesting for going there. But Phil, what's your favorite discount play for the week? Uh, Pick a Ram, any Ram. Okay. Alan Lazard. He's not a Ram. (laughs) No, that's mine. But yes, (laughs) good point. I didn't know that he wasn't a Ram. Thank you. Let's get weird. Theo Johnson, 2600, bottom of the basement, almost played every single snap for the Giants, and they're going up against that commander's defense. Just You're just going to keep keep mentioning. Didn't you mention him last week? I, I might have. He played like every single snap. I'm just saying <laughs> he's got somewhat athleticism. It's just they can't move the ball. But it, this is the resistible force meets the movable object this week with Giants and, and Commanders. So there. that's I'm, all we've got. Devin, tell the people again how they can win a Jonathan Taylor jersey and, and give them any party. No, games. it's any jersey that they want. It can even be. A oh, it's Watson. any jersey. It's not any even a jersey. Taylor jersey. No, 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 no. Any jersey you want. It could be a Deshaun Watson jersey. It could be a Brett Favre jersey. It could be any jersey you want. Yeah. It could be a, I don't know. We're going to stop there. Any jersey, any player, any size. All you have to do, 150 likes and comment how many DraftKings points Jonathan Taylor will have this week. Thank you, everybody. Go win something. 